Fred Craddock is the church's smallest giant. Physically, he's a tiny little guy, but his intelligence and talent are tremendous. Fred is one of America's premier preachers. In fact, Newsweek has named him one of the top ten living preachers, a pulpiteer renowned for his down-home approach and use of anecdotes to make his points. It has been said of Fred's stories, they show up in his sermons like the appearance of an old friend and guide us across the threshold of grace. Often Craddock talks about his experiences as a poor child growing up in western Tennessee. And he recalls the minister who was the pastor of the church his family attended for a time. In his own words, when I was a kid I went to church with my mother and the minister would speak to my mother, how are you Ms. Craddock? And the five of us kids would go along like little ducks along after our mother. How are you, Sonny? How are you, honey? How are you, Sonny? How are you, honey? But I remember when another minister came to our church, and about his fifth or sixth Sunday when I went along there, he said, Fred, how are you doing? He was the best minister that ever was at that church because there is a big difference between Sonny and Fred. A good number of years ago, country singer Johnny Cash had a hit song, a long song with the title, A Boy Named Sue. It told about the challenges he faced with such a name and how he, he was understandably embarrassed by it. But by the end, the lyrics indicate that he became accustomed to it and perhaps even proud of such a distinction. And the tune ends with the aggressively delivered line, My name is Sue, how do you do? Now, many of you know that I grew up in Fairlow, New Jersey, my family having moved there when I was going into the fifth grade. I guess that made me about nine years old at the time. We lived in Radburn, a section of Fairlawn completely surrounded by Fairlawn. But Radburn was rather unique. Everyone who resided there had to pay Radburn Association taxes. But these resulted in some great benefits. The community had two swimming pools and a gymnasium, tennis courts and ball fields, a theater group and a bowling league, and year-round recreational instruction and activities like swimming, softball, football, basketball, tennis, archery, dance socials and dance classes, and athletic games of all sorts, most of them for adults and youngsters. Best of all, except for the bowling, all these activities, after you paid your taxes, were free. Anyhow, one of the lifeguards and the archery instructor was a high school phys ed and health class teacher named Frank Bennett, who also served as the football and wrestling coach. Now, Frank was a block of a man, about 5'11 tall and just as wide, all muscle. He was not known for a cheery disposition or kindly attitude. Frank was tough and seemed to see it as his mission in life to make everyone else the same, especially the males under his authority. Now, either Frank had a horrible memory or he just didn't care, but he always called me boy. Did I take offense? Well, perhaps a little, but I couldn't be too upset because he called all the other boys boy. It was a rather remarkable coincidence, I suppose, that in a class of 20 or so kids, half of the males, all the males had the same name, boy. Now, it wasn't until I grew up and spent a year or two lifeguarding with Frank and then still later wound up sometimes refereeing wrestling matches with him, that he apparently discovered that my name was Herb. Now that was a distinction. Most of the other guys turned adult were still called boy. What's in a name? Wasn't it William Shakespeare who in Romeo and Juliet asked that question? Well, names are important. They help to identify us. And most primitive societies place a great emphasis on their significance, their value, they're magic. Indeed, among some peoples, each individual has up to three names. There is the name that person is given at birth and by which he or she is known throughout childhood. There is the name that person is given upon reaching the beginnings of adulthood, usually after going through some kind of initiation, testing, and ceremony, and by which he or she is known for the rest of his or her life. And then there is the secret name, considered the real name, a name kept hidden from all others, and derive from something unique about the person's character or experiences. To this name there is a mystical magic, and by its wrong use, its possessor can be hurt. Let's now take a look at today's scripture reading from Genesis, but first let me set the stage. Isaac and Rebekah had two sons, Esau and Jacob. They were twins, but very different. Esau the older was a manly man who spent most of his time outdoors as a hunter. 
Jacob the younger was the clever and sensitive type who, as the Bible says, preferred to hang around home. Isaac favored Esau. Rebekah favored Jacob. When the boys grew up and Isaac, now blind, was thought to be on his last legs, it was determined that the time had come for him to give his blessing and present the birthright to his principal heir, in this case, the older son Esau. Now, this was no small stuff. The birthright referred to the inheritance a child would receive when his or her father died, and usually it was an additional part of the total. So then Esau would receive twice as much as Jacob, two parts to one part. And the blessing was what designated the new head of the extended family. Here the replacement of Isaac by Esau as the potter familius. Earlier Jacob had tricked his very heavily muscled but rather dim-witted brother into trading both his birthright and his blessing for a bowl of beans when Esau came back from a hunting trip tired and hungry. But how could he in connivance with his mother trick Isaac into going along with such a change? Remember, Isaac was blind, so Jacob put on some of Esau's garments, which smelled like Esau, attached the skin of a young goat to his hands and neck, served his father the kind of meal that Isaac had asked Esau to get for him after a hunting expedition, and pretended to be his hairier sibling. By the time Esau returned from the field, it was too late. Esau ranted, Jacob cowered, but Isaac said that what was done was done, and he would not reverse what had occurred. However, Jacob was smart enough to realize that he would have little time to enjoy the fruits of his deception, especially when Esau said that he was going to kill him after, Jacob die, after uh, Isaac died. So he took off for Haran, where he planned to seek sanctuary with Laban, Rebekah's brother. Many years passed as Jacob and Laban partnered up, and Jacob married Laban's two daughters. But they had a falling out, and Jacob decided to go home. One problem. Esau was still there, and Jacob did not know whether or not his anger had lessened and his attitude had changed. But he took his family and possessions and went anyway, hoping to work things out with his brother when he got that far. They reached the banks of the Jabbok River, the boundary line of Esau's territory. After sending Esau presents to win his favor, well, actually to bribe him, Jacob sent his entourage across the stream and remained behind by himself. There, that night, he fell into a fitful slumber. The Bible tells us that a man came and wrestled with Jacob the entire night. Was this a real man and a real struggle, or a wrestling of the mind produced by Jacob's feelings of guilt and, guilt and, guilt and fear? At this point, and for the purposes of this sermon, it really doesn't matter. The end result was that after it was all over, and Jacob's adversary had not won, Jacob was convinced that he had somehow wrestled with God. And when his opponent asked for and was given Jacob's name, he said that he would no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because in the words of the account, you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Jacob had won for himself a new name through what he had accomplished, a name uniquely his own because this deed was uniquely his own. And this new name would be attached to all his descendants, identifying them by who and what they had come from. Pretty significant, don't you think? Speaking of names, for my 60th birthday, Lorraine asked if I would like to celebrate a Chuck E. Cheese's so that the grandkids could also enjoy the occasion. I enthusiastically re re agreed so long as we sat in the back of the restaurant away from the center of the action. When we arrived, I discovered that Lorraine had reserved tables right down in front by the stage on which the big mechanical rat comes out and performs. In the middle of the first table was a big balloon that proclaimed, Happy Birthday, Herb. I thought about the deception that, the deception that had been wrought upon me and declared that it would not be too bad since the kids were the ones sitting by the balloon and other patrons would assume that it was one of them celebrating a birthday. Our son Eric observed that that was unlikely since who in this day and age would name their son Herb? <laughs> Eric is still out of the will. <laughs> Herb. Whether or not we like our names, they are important and they mean something to us. Personally, I prefer Lance or Stone or Wolf to Herbert. But Herbert was my father's name, and it identifies me 
partly by thus attaching me to my past and the past of my family. So Herb it is. And we show our respect for others when we call them by their names because it demonstrates that we recognize them as particular persons and not just pieces of and within a group, whatever that group might be. Did Fred Craddock appreciate being called Sonny by his minister? No. Did Johnny Cash's character in that song appreciate being called Sue, even though that was his name? No. Did I appreciate being called Boy by Frank Bennett? No. All three instances being... All three instances evidenced a degree of sloppiness and insensitivity and disrespect. Sonny and Boy showing that the persons using them did not care enough to learn our real names. And Sue's mother showing that she did not care about her son's feelings or well-being by attaching to him such a ridiculous moniker. One which could only lead to trouble down the road. This last example reminds me of those parents who give their kids cutesy names, apparently neither recognizing nor caring that their kids will have to live with them. Names are important. We all want to be identified, we all want to be recognized, we all want to be respected. And when we are identified and recognized by our names, we feel respected because we know that the other cares enough to learn who we are. Unfortunately, too often we don't take the time and make the effort to do just that. This seems to be an important issue with Fred Craddock because he writes about an experience he had in Oklahoma when he was the guest of a wealthy man who owned a ranch, a ranch at which he did not live and which he visited periodically but infrequently. The two of them flew there one weekend so the man could touch base with Clyde, the ranch manager who held, had held that position for 17 years. When they arrived, Clyde greeted them warmly and told them that lunch was ready in the ranch house. They went in and sat down to one of the best meals Craddock said that he had ever eaten. Good country food ending with apple pie and coffee, all served by the woman who had cooked it. As they ate, she put another log on the fire and then went into the kitchen to eat her own lunch. Craddock reports that he would have liked another cup of coffee and would have enjoyed going into the kitchen to sit with the cook so that she would not have to stay there and eat by herself. But he knew that she would have been embarrassed by such an approach, and if he had asked for more coffee, she would have jumped up to get it, pretending that she was done with her meal. So he let the opportunity pass. However, as we were leaving, he asked Clyde, as they were leaving, he asked Clyde if he could thank the lady for such a fine meal. Clyde indicated that he would pass along the message. The two men then left the ranch house to head back to the airport, and the following is Craddock telling of the conversation which took place. We started out to the car, and I said to my host, I would like to have thanked the lady for the fine meal. Clyde will tell her. I said, well, it really was a good meal. He said, yeah, she's a good cook. I said, who is she? He says, she's Clyde's wife. I said, what's her name? And he said, uh, uh, I think her name is Ruth. Clyde's been managing his place for 17 years, and he thinks her name is Ruth? This reminds me of the teacher at a private swanky high school who made his students learn the names of the custodians who cleaned their rooms and kept their school in good working condition in an attempt to teach them consideration and humility. He had the feeling that some of them had a tendency to look down upon those who they considered to be beneath them. Are we ever guilty of doing that? When Harry Van Fossen was our music director and tenor soloist, he had a favorite song. Perhaps we could call it his signature song which he sang frequently because people loved to hear it and would request it over and over. The title, there's something about that name. The name the song refers to is Jesus, and the piece indicates some of what is special about it. It's in our hymnal, and Adrian is going to sing it for us now. Jesus, 
Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. As with Jesus, a name helps to identify a person. When we hear the name of, of a person we know, it makes us think about what that person is like and puts together in our minds a composite of that individual. So there is something about every name and the one who possesses it. What's special about you is reflected in what's special about your name. And since everyone is special in some way, everyone's name is also special. The person and his or her name cannot be separated. Let's remember that when we deal with others. And let's always treat respectfully those with whom we come in contact. God somehow made you and me and everyone. He didn't give us our names, but who and what we are comes to mind when our names are called. My name is Herb. I guess that's not so bad after all. <laughs> 